Nobody puts baby in a corner. Sorry about the disruption, folks. But I always do the last dance of the season. But this year, somebody told me not to. So I'm going to do my kind of dancing with a great partner who's not only a terrific dancer, but somebody who's taught me that there are people willing to stand up for other people no matter what it costs them. Somebody who's taught me about the kind of person I want to be. I'm Zach Bennett. I was born in 1981, but somehow I missed out on seeing the greatest movies of the 1980s. So I'm fixing that. I'm going to watch these great films and talk about them with my friends who have loved them for decades. This is Video Oblivious. Episode 2, 1987's Dirty Dancing. Well, my guest this week on uh, Video Oblivious is a friend of mine. We've known each other, I don't know, what, about 13 years or so? Seems like it was yeah. around 2010 that we yeah, got was, to know each other. Yeah, uh, it seems like it was about right. I think it was the fall after I was on Jeopardy, so that would be it the was. fall of 2010. Yeah. It was a uh, a Tuesday night against Calgary, I think. We, uh, went to <laughs> I, think I think we actually met on Twitter. My guest <laughs> is J.R. Lind, Hello. an award-winning journalist, uh, and as he mentioned, a Jeopardy champion. Uh, he's uh, definitely one of the smartest and wittiest guys I know, so I'm really glad that he uh, he decided to join me on this podcast, and we'll talk dirty dancing here in just a few minutes. But uh, what, uh, yeah, we got to know each other. I think it was on Twitter around like election season, Yeah, and then we started going to hockey games together and, and just became friends after that, and we've kept been in contact even as you've moved across the country from nashville to los angeles yes uh, it's two hours earlier for me uh so <laughs> it's still the morning to me i'm still fresh and bushy-tailed um, well good morning to you so <laughs> give me a little bit of of your background uh basically just like how old are you what are some things you're interested in and and how did we i mean we got we talked about how we got to know each other but just you know when when did you grow up where did you grow up that sort of thing yeah, so I'm. Uh, I had to think about this because when you, you, as you know, as you get older, you forget actually how old you are. But I'm, <laughs> I'm yep. 42, uh, so I'm a, a child of the 80s and 90s, just like you. I grew up in Hendersonville, uh, about what 20 miles northwest of Nashville, mm -hmm. um, and was you know I was in Middle Tennessee most of my life. I did go to school in Alabama, and of course I was in the Navy, of course naturally, uh, for four <laughs> years, and uh, lived in England for a time, and. Uh, came oh, back wow. home. Yeah. Came back home and worked at the scene for a couple of stints for probably close to a decade altogether and uh, took a new job and moved to California about a year ago. So mm -hmm. I am now out there in Tinseltown now working, uh, keeping your eye on the entertainment industry. Well, it's, it's interesting that we're going to be talking about a movie. Let's talk about Dirty Dancing. Yes. Uh, it came out in 1987, written by Eleanor Bergstein, directed by Emil Ardolino. It actually won an award in Norway for best foreign film because <laughs> uh, it was directed by a Norwegian. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah. It's 101 minutes long, PG-13. The studio that put it out, a, a company called Vestron Pictures. This was really their only release of note. Uh, and they went out of business five years later. They went bankrupt in 1992. I was looking and, at their uh, roster of movies. It is, uh, there's a lot of like direct to video sequels of, of bad, <laughs> horror, of already bad horror movies like Chud 2. <laughs> Chud was not a movie that we needed. We, there, there didn't need to be a Chud extended universe, but apparently there was. I'm not even sure what that is. Uh, well, that's probably well, you why they put that on the list. Yeah. <laughs> 1992, they went out of business. Uh, Lionsgate has since uh, acquired their library. Cast Jennifer Grey was cast first. Of course, she is the the central character, Baby Hauserman. Um, others that were considered for the role of Baby were Winona Ryder, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Sharon Stone. Sharon Stone would have been a choice. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, we might get into this. I yeah, I think Jennifer Grey's casting was really good because she's pretty, but she's not she's not an intimidatingly attractive woman. You know, like Sharon Stone is sort of like more of like a classically beautiful yeah. blonde woman, but Jennifer Grey and I if this would have been after Ferris Bueller, right? Surely it was the year after yeah. Ferris Bueller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she had a little bit of a cachet there, I guess. She did. Uh, Patrick Swayze, of course, plays Johnny Castle. Now he was cast specifically because they wanted a dancer who could act. And when they looked at him first, they thought he would be a great choice. But he actually had on his resume 
uh, no dancing roles because he had had suffered a knee injury a couple of years earlier and thought that that would aggravate that and he wouldn't want to do it. Uh, but he agreed to it after he saw the script. And and uh, so his casting wound up being perfect for the role, uh, even though he um, initially didn't want to do it. Uh, but others that were considered, they screen tested Billy Zane for that role. <laughs> I've actually and seen that screen test. Uh, you have. <laughs> yes, it is. uh uh, for folks who went a, a little more, there's a great series on Netflix called um, The Movies That Made Us. And there's an episode about Dirty Dancing and it includes Billy Zane's screen test. And it is. Oh, wow. It's, you know, you remember those SNL sketches where they had like the the fake screen tests for. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Star Wars. <laughs> like Star it's Wars, a lot yeah, like yeah. that because you're like, I'm familiar with the scene he's doing. But Billy Zane is not. This is not for you. This is not, yeah, and, you know. And, and they said his chemistry with Jennifer Grey was horrible. Well, that's um, interesting. Val Kilmer was up for that role, and so was Benicio Del Toro, interestingly. Uh, well, I, I mean, I guess you could play it a little like, you know, he's like a, a you know, Mexican dance teacher or whatever. But <laughs> Johnny Castle well, doesn't really work with that name. Johnny, The, the role uh, of Johnny Castle was originally supposed to be uh, of an Italian descent. Oh. But after Swayze was cast, they changed it to Irish. For, <laughs> so I guess if Del Toro was cast, it would have been Mexican. Perhaps. Yeah, uh, that's, um, uh, that's wild. Uh, getting into the supporting cast, Jerry Orbach. We all know him from Law and Order. Uh, uh, he plays the dad, Dr. Hauserman. Cynthia Rhodes is Penny Johnson. Did you know Cynthia Rhodes is from Nashville? I didn't until I saw your notes. That uh, I had no idea. that there She was... uh, went to Glencliff High School and actually got her dancing start at Opryland USA of theme course. park. That's where she learned how to dance. <laughs> wow. Just like everybody of that generation. That's yeah. how they got into the entertainment industry. Was it? Or certainly, certainly had their first jobs there. Uh, Definitely. The whole generation of Nashvilleians. I just missed it. It closed right before I turned 16, so I didn't get the chance. Uh, but but I work there now in my right. 40s. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Uh, Max Cantor plays Robbie Gould, uh, not the 49ers kicker. Um, Jack Westerman plays Max Kellerman, not the ESPN commentator. So I thought that was hilarious because, I, I you know, the, the point of this podcast is I've never seen these movies until <laughs> – now and i just now watched it this morning like i just finished watching <laughs> oh like it literally like today all right three hours ago <laughs> right and um and, and when i'm watching the opening credits and it says jack westerman as max <laughs> kellerman i had to pause it and i went max kellerman was an espn commentator for 20 years a boxing analyst By the boxing uh, like the guy who was the boxing guy like he was yeah the and, voice and of i boxing. had to google i had to google and say is max kellerman like, is that a stage name? Did he pick that for this movie? No, that's his actual name. <laughs> it's just uh, so, weird. <laughs> it's a very weird coincidence, I'm sure. So he was, if this movie came out in 87 and he's, I think, 50 now, he would have been, what, like 15 when this movie oh, came okay. out. Probably relentlessly I'm teased. <laughs> I'm sure he was. I'm sure he was. It was great to see Wayne Knight. Yes. Uh, Stan, uh, he'll always be Newman, no matter what he does. Um, and then uh, Matthew Broderick actually makes very a cameo, briefly, yeah, <laughs> very briefly in the in the final scene. Now he and Jennifer Grey had just finished doing Ferris Bueller the previous year, and they were actually dating at the time. So that's how uh, he got in the movie. And you know who else? Uh, her mother uh, is Kelly Bishop, who, like Jerry Orbach, was probably at the time better known for her work on the stage, but uh, yeah. later became. Um, the grandmother on Gilmore Girls. Oh, okay. See, I didn't watch Gilmore Girls either. Oh, so I didn't know man. That. But, oh, but I do man. know that, that <laughs> she was cast originally in a different role, and the actress who played Baby's mother had to back out oh. uh, very early in filming, and so they moved her into that role. So she was not supposed to have the prominent role that she did in that film. Huh. Uh, premiered it in uh, Cannes in June of 1987. It was released in August. It's wild. What's that? Dirty Dancing premiered at Cannes. <laughs> it did. It earned. Check this out, though. It was one of the most successful movies ever as far as percentage gained versus spent. Four and a half million dollar budget. It actually came in under budget. It was wow. budgeted for five, came in at four and a half, was finished on time and under budget and earned. And this is just at the box office. Two hundred fourteen million dollars. Since then, it has become uh, it was the first video cassette i think to sell a million copies uh it has uh, through the years continued to sell many many hundreds of thousands millions of copies on various platforms but interestingly enough 
it's not available for streaming anywhere right now. It's not on in, any of the services. So to watch it, I had to buy it. <laughs> so, so I just added one more to the total. You have, you have a new DVD of uh, well, days. actually, I bought it. I bought it on streaming. I could I could oh, download I it, but but it's not. You know, it, it's funny with all the. Um, as popular as that movie is, yeah, uh, cool. that it's not available on Netflix or Max or Paramount Plus or Peacock, none of them. Uh, and uh, the only way to get it is to rent it or buy it. That's crazy. Uh, 72% on Rotten Tomatoes. If you go back and aggregate the the uh, reviews, it got a cinema score at the time of A-. minus. Audiences liked it. Uh, Siskel and Ebert. Siskel gave it a marginal thumbs up. He said the performances were good. Ebert hated it. Um, he said it had a, quote, idiot plot. That was oh, his, how his words. How dare you. Uh, it did win an Oscar and a Golden Globe, but both for Best Original Song for I've Had the Time of My Life. Um, that song also won a Grammy for Best Pop Performance by a duo or group for Bill Medley and Jennifer Warren. So real quick, going to run through the plot. Uh, everybody, of course, has probably seen this now that I have. Uh, <laughs> the family uh, goes to the Catskills to a, to a resort in the Borscht Belt for a summer vacation filled with big band music and dancing. This takes place in the summer of 1963. She points out in the opening monologue that it was before Kennedy got shot and America still had its innocence. Uh, baby is 17 years old, which provides its own problems later in the film. Um, She overhears the proprietor of the resort, Max Kellerman, telling his wait staff that they need to romance all of the guest daughters, no matter how (laughs) beautiful or ugly they are. Yes. Um, And at this point, she first spies Johnny Castle uh, and Max tells the entertainment staff they need to keep their hands off the ladies uh, who are the guests. So no touching. Um, She sees one of the staff, Billy, struggling to carry three watermelons up a flight of stairs. So she offers to help. And when she gets to the top of the stairs, there's a private dirty dancing party held amongst the staff. Um, It's there that she finds that one of the instructors or not there, but she meets all of the the principal characters at this party. And there's an initial dancing scene to get things kicked off. The the Uh, deeply integrated staff, I would point out, obviously, this was in New York and not the South in 1963. But there was a it was a diverse, relatively diverse staff for the. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, even for a movie made in the late 80s. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, she later finds out that one of the instructors, Penny, Johnny's dance partner, is pregnant. Now, it's made clear that Penny and Johnny are, are platonic, uh, but Penny wants an abortion, but she doesn't want to do it because it'll interrupt her big money making show with Johnny. Plus, she doesn't have the money for it. So Baby has, has a solution for both problems. She volunteers to stand in for Penny at the show, even though she can't dance. dance yeah. And she asks her father for the abortion money without telling him why, and he gives it to her uh by the way i might note the word abortion is never once uttered in the what do they say take care of it or something yeah Yeah. it's it's all completely implied uh but it's clear what it is but the word is never once mentioned uh johnny teaches baby how to dance because they agree to this this plan they perform the show but baby's a little insecure so she skips the climactic uh, lift and but it's still a success meanwhile at the same time penny has her abortion but it's botched and she nearly dies and baby's father is a doctor so she asks him to come help uh take care of her and then everything goes to hell from there he assumes that it's johnny's child and he forbids baby from spending any more time with the staff and obviously that doesn't happen the whole rest of the movie is basically baby sneaking off to be with johnny <laughs> yes <laughs> from the, there's about a 20 minute lull there where it's just nothing but dancing and pg-13 sex for yeah. like 25 30 minutes um then one of the older guests uh, during that time, they fall in love. Of course, of course, one of the older guests uh, makes an advance at Johnny. He rebuffs it. But when she spies Johnny with baby, she then gets back at him by accusing him of stealing her husband's wallet. But uh, to clear Johnny, baby has to admit, oh, no, I was having sex yeah, with Johnny. Right. At the time. I have the perfect alibi. He <laughs> was having we sex with a teenager. Dinner. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, but Johnny is is moved by this because it's the first time anyone has ever stood up for him in his entire life. Uh, we flash forward to the end, the climactic scene. Jake gives a letter of recommendation to the 49ers kicker, Robbie Gould, uh, <laughs> who um, he, he he had hooked up with the other daughter, Lisa, yes, <laughs> baby's Lisa, older yeah. sister. But then Robbie randomly just admits that the that Penny's uh, child was his and uh and Jake takes the letter back and tells him to get lost. And that's when Johnny re-enters and the iconic line, nobody puts baby in the corner. And then he takes her up on stage for the climactic dance scene. And we end with the big lift. So it's um, that's that's dirty dancing in a nutshell. So what is your 
JR, what's your connection to this film? Like what, when did you, do you remember first seeing it? Uh, why did you sign up to do this movie? With <laughs> I do remember the, well, I don't because know. I, I got to admit when I saw you it said <laughs> on the list, JR Lynn for Dirty Dancing, I thought, well, isn't that a chick flick? It'll be interesting for two dudes to talk about this. Uh, well, so I have an older sister. She's five years older than me, but I, I specifically remember, uh, the first time I saw, or the, when we, we rented this from Kroger, of course, you remember, you know, I before remember Kroger having a video store before Blockbuster, you, you rented uh, movies from Kroger. So I remember yep. renting it. I, so I would have been, you know, six or seven, eight years old. Obviously the, the abortion subplot probably went over my head. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and since then I've probably seen it, you know, I mean, scores of times I, uh, I couldn't begin to tell you how many times I've seen this movie. And uh, I don't know, it was just always like part of my life. And, uh, you know, I love it. I know it it is a, a chick flick. It was obviously aimed at a certain demographic. But I first of all, I love Patrick Swayze uh, unequivocally. I think Patrick Swayze is really was a great actor who was sort of saddled in like a bunch of genre movies. And, uh, and also like every interview I've ever read with Patrick Swayze with one notable exception, which I'm sure we'll talk about later was, you know, how universally beloved he was and how nice he was. But I, I really think he was very good. And I agree with whichever of Siskel or Ebert actually gave it a thumbs up. I think the Siskel. acting Siskel, I think the acting in this movie is really good. Um, I think Swayze's great. I think uh, Jerry Orbach is probably has the best performance of anybody, even though he's probably what the third or fourth main character in the movie, but uh, he, Jake goes through the most sort of change in the movie. Uh, you know, uh, Kelly Bishop has, a, has some laugh lines. The sister is kind of ridiculous, but uh, the other thing I remember about this movie is baby's name is Francis. Yep. And uh, I remember my dad was a longtime history teacher and he got the joke long before she gave it away, which is at the end of the movie. Her, She's named for the the first woman in the cabinet, Frances per Perkins, who was FDR's Secretary of Labor. And I remember my dad going, I wonder if she's named for Frances Perkins, uh, FDR's Secretary of Labor. And I was like, I mean, you know, I'm seven years old. I'm like, why would my dad bring that up? Uh, and that has that's the other thing. And, and I hate to be the guy who's like, let's do a think piece about this sort of silly movie. No, go for there, it. There, there is a lot of that movie, and and she, as you mentioned, she said specifically, it's in the summer of 1963. So, uh, for the the post World War II, post Roosevelt American left Democratic Party, this was a high water mark, right? Vietnam hadn't started bringing down the party and and dragging them down, which would ultimately end up with Nixon being in the Oval Office, which was a pretty low point for for Democrats in the 20th century. Uh, but she is obviously like the idealistic 60s, um, you know, future progressive, right? She, mm -hmm. she alludes throughout the movie to things that are going on in Vietnam, which wasn't really part of the consciousness at that time. Uh, her parents are very... She talks about wanting to join the Peace Corps. That's her... Right. Oh, yeah. Which, yeah. Which was, you know, um, this sort of like shining vision that... JFK had my dad was in the Peace Corps, by the way, uh, about this oh, really? about that time. Yeah, he taught uh, English to Koreans. Um, my dad spoke Korean and still speaks Korean, which is a weird thing for a history teacher in Middle Tennessee to do. But here we are. <laughs> um, and uh, but her parents are very much part of the, sort of the mid-century uh, American intelligence left. You know that this idealism. Obviously, they they named their child out of after FDR's secretary of labor. I mean, uh, <laughs> and, and what baby encounters is probably for the first time in her life, uh, Johnny, who mentions that he can join the plasterers union. Uh, so she has been surrounded sort of by the elite city wing of the American left. And she's encountering for the first time, the working class American left. And she also meets Robbie who, uh, is walking around with a copy of the fountainhead. Right. I mean, he tries mm -hmm. to make her read Ayn Rand, uh, in 1964, Barry Goldwater 
will be the first really hard libertarian conservative to run for the Republican Party. So it, it, there's all these sort of like mixtures of what was happening uh, in politics in America in 1963 that are being represented by all these different characters. And, you know, you have uh, Max himself. He thinks that the, the old order is dying away, right? He says, this is the last time kids are going to go to Europe and they're not going to want to come here. And, you know, yeah. all of this, this tradition, which is represented by him and by her parents, this, you know, this coalition is dying and now we have this whole other thing. So I, I started to see that in it. I probably too much to ask for, but, no, uh, I, and of course so they talk about they... abortion, which is, you know, was a, you know, was and is remains a, a Still is, issue. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I'm so glad that I that, that you signed up to do this one because I never would have made any of those connections. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> one of the smartest guys I know, for real. <laughs> and no, it really that, that that's uh, a great insight for me. Uh, and if I watch this movie again, I'll definitely take keep that in mind because it, it that went over my head for sure. Because <laughs> I don't I don't have that that level of history knowledge. So that, and, no, and you, thank you. And you've great. only seen the movie once and not 150 times. So uh, <laughs> is that why you keep getting drawn back to it for its its yeah, geopolitical like I'm, influence? I'm looking. Yeah, I'm going to look for the hints. Like which <laughs> which one of these people is Adelaide Stevenson? Um, <laughs> That's great. So uh, I think you might have mentioned this earlier. What's the first thing you think of when you think of this movie? Uh, it just off the top of your head, if, if I were to say Dirty Dancing, what's the first thing you think of? I think about uh, it, it. To me, the memory is of watching it with my family and, and you know, getting pizza on a Friday night and watching this movie. And I'm sure we rented it more than once. And then, you know, then we got cable and right and was on TBS all the time. Um, yeah. And. You know, uh, it was filmed in Lake Lure, North Carolina. Uh, it was. And, and also another spot in Virginia. And my parents have vacationed there. And like, you know, uh, I, I don't know how you make North Carolina look like the Catskills. I guess you can't smell the humidity in a movie. But um, <laughs> <laughs> well, they said they chose it primarily because it was the only place that uh, where they could find a, a building that would match what those Borscht Belt oh, resorts yeah. looked like, uh, because by that point in the in the mid '80s, they had already all been torn down. So, and you know, the other thing was because of when this movie came out, uh, and this is sort of like you know, if you go back and watch the Wonder Years, and you're like, well, this was only 20 years after that happened. You know, uh, like the events of that movie were only 25 years old, much like when the wonder year started, the events of the wonder years were only 20 or 25 years old. So, right. Yeah. You know, I would, there's nothing particularly sixties about dirty dancing. I mean, I think the themes are universal, right? You're wrong side of the tracks romance. Like it's, uh, it's a story that's been told in movies a lot, but sort of like those specifics were things that my parents remembered. And, uh, you know, so there was a, I may have more nostalgia for the experience of watching the movie than I do for the movie itself. Although I do love it. Uh, I think the soundtrack is fantastic, although yeah. it's really incongruous. Uh, That's, I was going to bring that up. We'll get to that. We'll get to <laughs> okay. That. Well, I want to get to that yeah. because I was reviewing the soundtrack and I was like, this is so weird. But I've, of course I had it. My sister had it on tape. Yep. And then uh, I had it once I had a car. Uh, I had it on CD, which was just, again, a weird thing for a 17 year old boy to be listening to, but you know, uh, it's great. So I, I well, just have like a happy uh, feeling about the movie. Okay. That's good. So, so, uh, th like I mentioned, I hadn't seen it before this morning and I didn't know until yesterday when I was trying to find it on streaming and I found the synopsis on Amazon where I wound up renting it from, um, that it was even set in 1963. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, I, I had just thought it was set in 1987 when the movie came out. Uh, and then, uh, I was looking, I'm watching it going, well, you're right. Everything in the sick, it does kind of have that sixties feel except for Jennifer Gray's hair. Yes. Uh, which is very, eighties. very mid eighties. Uh, she looks exactly like she did playing Jeannie Bueller the year <laughs> earlier. Um, I mean, it was, it was like, okay, I, that there's a little inconsistency there. And I guess that's why just from seeing photos of the movie and clips and, posters it's just if i had seen a more period haircut it would have said okay clearly this was set in well, her time. like the, her the, lisa has very like straight 60s sort of like early 60s hair uh with a barrette and everything yeah. yeah and um jerry orbach jake is wearing like kind of like the close crop with you know uh 
tonic, I'm sure, in his hair. You know, like uh, uh, what's the old school hair hair gel? You know, I can at least yeah, picture him like, yeah, yeah, putting pomade in his hair. But no, but Jennifer Gray's like, no, I'm gonna have this perm. I'm just, I'm gonna, it's gonna, <laughs> that's what we're gonna do. So, um, I, I will say, I, I really did enjoy watching this. Uh, I would say I would give it probably three and a half, four stars out of five. Uh, like I said, there was a lull r- right it, there once it, it hit that first dancing contest or the show or whatever. Yeah. Um, where she steps in for Penny. From there on, there's a, it's there's not a lot advancement in the plot for a while. It's just her learning how to dance more and the two of them falling in love. But as far as story beats, there's nothing else there for a while. I don't. Know why um, they added it out like that because it's long you know they if you want to get it to 80 minutes it could have cut a half an hour but it, but it does just yeah. keep going on there in that part it's an hour and 40 minute film yeah uh, i mean it's, it's that's a it, long it, it does drag there toward the end for sure um but yeah the what one thing i i wanted to uh to bring up was the 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 soundtrack um because it's got a lot of this great classic early 60s oh, yeah. rock and roll in it and and i mean it starts out with uh, be my little baby it's on, baby, over the, the opening credits yeah. and yeah and and it just goes on and on and on and then there will be just a random 1980s <laughs> soundtrack song and just mixed in and it's like it completely takes you out of the period piece. And then we get to the end <laughs> and I've had the time of my yeah. life with all of its synthesized goodness. Um, clearly a song from 1986, 87. Uh, and the note that I made was that is more out of place than Johnny B. Good was at the, the enchantment under the sea yeah. dance and back to the future. It's just uh, so I'm, weird. Like, because it's not like the characters hear that song. Right. And even Max Max asks his band leader, do you have sheet music for this? And, yeah, so he's like, clearly they're hearing it. <laughs> and it's so out of place, but it's such an iconic song for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, and, and, you know, I guess there is a, an artistic connection because of Bill Medley, but who was a, a righteous brother. Uh, right. To make that clear. But yeah, you, you know, you go through the whole thing and like, you know, you know, the Ronettes are at the beginning and then uh, they get the big girls don't cry and these mm-hmm. great sort of like late doo um, uh What's the one I'm thinking? Oh, oh, hey, baby, which mm-hmm. uh, if I remember correctly, in uh, my parents listened to 96.3, the the old oldies back before it was Jack when it was the oldies, 96.3. Yep. But, uh, you know, the 80s were really like after the big chill. Uh, which I don't know if you've seen, if it's not, that should be on your list for this podcast, but it's not. And it will be now. <laughs> yeah. So oldies had really like the music of the the fifties and sixties had largely disappeared from the radio uh, until the big chill. Um, and so, and then dirty dancing was also kind of part of that movement that like, you know, uh, Hey baby, like by Bruce channel, which is a great song and is now, part of every marching band's repertoire in the history of the world, uh-huh. but was, you know, it was like a, a dusty 45 until whoever the music supervisor, I applaud you, uh, dirty dancing music supervisor for, for dragging these songs that now feel like, Oh, of course, you know, love is strange. And like, we remember these great songs, uh, but nobody remembered them. they were, they were gone. <laughs> they were dragged out of the dustbin. So, and then of course, yes. Th- then you have Eric Carmen, uh, singing hungry eyes and and patrick swayze she's like the win uh a movie a song that he tried to sell to like every movie in the 80s and he finally was in a movie where it made some sense um yep pablo talks about i think it was trying to be in like he wanted to get it in young blood or something and uh you know and they were like trying to find a place for it at red dawn and it was like that doesn't make you know <laughs> yes this war film uh yeah. but he finally gets it in in dirty dancing so and good two for of those you. songs Hungry Eyes and I've Had the Time of My Life have not only were big hits of the day, but they've endured up to now. I mean, you still hear them on oh, yeah. uh, on on light rock AC stations <laughs> every day. It's they're two of those songs from the from the late eighties that have just endured through the through the decades. If you think about it, you mentioned uh, nineteen uh, eighty seven to nineteen sixty three was twenty four years. So we would make Dirty Dancing today about the summer of nineteen ninety nine. Hey, well that makes sense because that was the year I graduated from high school. Was, <laughs> there you go. Me too. I don't know. It's, it's like early Blink one eighty two. 
it was uh yeah and then we could talk about well it was the a couple of years before 9 11 and yeah and, uh, all right I mean, that was just, what she would be thinking about in the car on the way to her vacation i guess yeah, so, yeah. before the world changed uh interesting uh one other thing i think i mentioned this earlier they never once said the word abortion in the movie and i wonder if that was a stylistic choice uh, my my wife I, I mentioned it to her this morning and she said well of course you didn't say that word in the 60s it was a horrible word and i was like okay well the movie was made in the 80s uh yeah. it was much more uh top of mind topic in in the 80s than it was the 60s for sure but it's still interesting that it was not mentioned that that word was not mentioned anywhere in the film i could certainly see the characters in the movie not saying it but there's there's voiceover work and and you know and jake was a doctor i mean he would have yeah. used the the clinical and he said would you send her to a butcher which i love that scene i i mean it's it's awful because he's blaming johnny for something he right. didn't do but but he, there there's this like level of of a doctor because he becoming a doctor in that moment and and whatever his feelings are about abortion is that he despises what this person he probably wouldn't even consider a doctor has done to her because it was obviously a back alley abortion because it was 1963. Right. But, you know, it, there's there's this look in his face of just disgust at anybody who would put a, another human through what she had gone through. Uh, and again, I think Jerry Orbach is so good in this movie. Uh, he is. He's and, very good. And, and, and Jerry Orbach is sort of renowned as, as a great actor. Uh, especially uh, on the stage, which is everybody remembers him for law and order because he was great in that. But largely the reason he got law and order was, or he agreed to do law and order is because it was filmed in New York and he could continue to act on Broadway while he was filming law and order. Whereas a show filmed in LA is makes that a little more difficult, but, um, but Orbach is, is really, really, really good at this movie. I, I can't emphasize enough. I, I, Maybe my favorite performance of his that I've seen, except for right. the Candelabra and Beauty and the Beast. Uh, <laughs> I forgot that was him. <laughs> I totally forgot that was him. Um, well, watching it from a 2023 perspective, I will just say it is. It made me uncomfortable that her name was Baby <laughs> for whatever reason. That just felt dirty. Uh, pardon the pun with the name of the movie, but it just yeah. it didn't feel right. Uh, it, it, the um, the writer of the film that was her nickname when she was a teenager oh. they called her baby and that's why jennifer gray's character was named baby uh, eleanor bergstein bergstein the writer um partly based this on her life uh at, at, or at the basis for it of going to these catskills resorts that was where the idea came from and her nickname as a kid was baby so that's why that but it just felt weird it is and weird, then yeah. and then there's the line Nobody puts baby in the corner, yep. which is, is the one that everybody thinks of when they hear this movie. It's quoted to this day. And I was just waiting for it. I'm like, I know it's coming at some point. Right. I know. I know it's coming. And I was just expecting this big crescendo with a score to this big magic movie moment. And it's just not there he just <laughs> says it almost understated to the point where the band on stage singing the kellerman's anthem <laughs> alma mater is yeah. almost drowning it out and he just says nobody puts baby in the corner and grabs her and they go up on stage and i was like oh that was it that's and, that line i've been hearing about for 35 years and, and he's it's like and he's also like turning as he says it so he's not even like full address to the camera you know and it's like obviously they didn't know you know it, it again, to reference my dad as a history teacher, the thing you always have to remember about history is that the people who are doing it, they're just, that's just their life, right? Like oh, Patrick, yeah, yeah. Patrick Swayze probably didn't look at the script and go, oh, well, this is going to be the one, you know? That's like, the, 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 yeah. Uh, or, and nor did the director or, it, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's filmed from like across the room. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, and, and I love Kelly Bishop right after that because uh, he stands up, Jake stands up, you know, to go after her after he's pulled her off and, and Kelly Bishop grabs his sleeve and goes, sit down, Jake, or, <laughs> you know, something like, uh, you know, yeah. and, and Let this happen. that's the one that's like the close up line, right? They, they zoom in on her saying that and not the, what has become the iconic line, you know, moments before. Right. Yeah. Uh, this movie had everything going against it. I mentioned uh, it was made on a budget of $5 million. Which, that was actually half of what it was originally budgeted. 
they had, they had budgeted 10. They, uh, they slashed it to five and they still came in under budget at four and a half, four and a half million dollars to make this movie. That was even what? in 1987. That's stupid cheap. Yeah. That's like, um, uh, that's like the lunch budget for a movie now. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, they had a promotional sponsor to help promote it because they didn't have much of a budget <laughs> to promote it. Uh, so they had locked in clear and they were going to oh, do like perfect. a co-op thing because it was, it was targeted to teenage girls. Basically the movie was, um, so they had, they had tapped clear Clearasil clear saw a screening of the movie and they said, we're not going to be involved with any movie where the plot is an abortion. abortion yeah. <laughs> and, and they backed out entirely. And then the studio was like, okay, we'll just promote it on what shoestring budget we have. The, the, but they hated it. The studio hated this movie when they saw it. One of the executives said, I want them to burn the negatives and collect the insurance money because wow. they thought it was going to be a flop. And it wound up being one of the most financially successful movies of all time. And then there was the, the little matter that Jennifer Grey and Patrick Swayze did not like each other at all. Yeah, I alluded to this earlier about how everybody talks about how lovely Patrick Swayze is, with one exception. <laughs> yeah, so so we'll get into that. But their chemistry, they said, was undeniable. And it was. When you see them on screen, it was very strong. But the producers had to treat that relationship with kid gloves throughout, <laughs> the, throughout the movie because they just didn't get along very well at all. And that traced back to their time working together on red dawn, red dawn right. earlier. so what was the what was the interview uh you were talking about because i'm i'm unfamiliar oh, I, I, I don't i mean i uh, nothing specific it's just you know uh, it's just famous that jennifer gray and patrick swayze did not get along and there were, never appeared to be any sort of reconciliation about it uh she doesn't really talk about this movie very much uh, well, that's interesting yeah. because she is she is attached to the sequel that is planned oh, uh, to come out in 2025. Well, it, it, a check will fix a lot of things, I'm sure. Uh, that's <laughs> true. Yeah. They're planning to make a sequel to this. Uh, I don't know if the, the WGA and SAG Act for Strike had uh, have affected that. I'm sure it has, but it's originally planned for the summer of 2025. Uh, I seriously doubt any filming has begun on it even at this point. Let's say, how's the movie aged as we, we start to wind things down here? We talked about if it if it were made today, would be made about the summer of 1999, which is interesting. <laughs> um, but I think because it's a period piece, I think it's actually aged well because you could make it today and still set it in 1963. Yeah, it works uh, on that level. I and there's not. I'm trying to think. There's nothing really that, that probably hits you over the head a little more with the abortion thing now, uh, rather than play it subtle. That's been sort of a move in movies yeah. lately. Has been to we're, we're not going to let the audience figure anything out on their own. Uh, yeah, we're, 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 we'll probably be like direct address to the camera to figure it out. But yeah, there's nothing in there that I that I mean, her name is cringy. Yes, um, yeah, her name is cringy. And uh, I mean, but the the people that say obnoxious things are people you're supposed to hate. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like yeah. Robbie Robbie sucks. That's why Robbie says sucky stuff because he yeah. sucks. <laughs> so uh, I mean, and Lisa's sort of you know. Uh, She's a kind of a, a sort of stereotypical, like late teen girl, but yeah, she's a stereotype. You know, I mean, sometimes you have to, sometimes cliches work because they're familiar to people and that's like how you have to tell a story. But I don't think there, you would have to change too terribly much if you wanted to make it again, which let's not give Hollywood any ideas. Um, well, <laughs> They did make it again in 2017. It was a made-for-TV musical. Uh, Abigail Breslin was the star. She played Baby. Uh, Deborah Messing was in it, uh, several other actors of note. Uh, but it, it was largely negatively received, as you might imagine. But I think 7 million people watched it on the Ooh. night it came on on ABC. Uh, and then they did a stage adaptation of it uh, for four, uh, five years, I think it was. It was fairly successful in London. It, it toured the United States. It toured Europe. But it never made made it to Broadway. It never had a um, never had a, a residency there in New York City. Uh, and then in 1988, now this was cashing in on the success. You think about the movie came out in 87. It did not even crack the top 10 movies of that year. It was <laughs> never the number one movie of, uh, of when it was released. It was never the top movie in the country and it did not crack the top 10. Um, but it had such a life on home video. Yeah, I was going to say it has a long tail. Uh, it, yeah, the same and, way I encountered it, right? Like, I mean, they probably just didn't have a lot of distribution. It just yeah, the <laughs> next year on CBS, they developed a television series oh that God. basically told the same story. Did you know this? No, I did um, not. 
It was it was called Dirty Dancing. It was 11 episodes before it got canceled, uh, but it was basically the same characters. Now they reorganized some stuff. They made baby Max's daughter instead of one of the guests. But it was the same basic story with different actors and not too many names you would recognize from that list, except for baby was played by Melora Hardin. Oh, one of your favorites. Jan on The Office. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it looks um, like McLean but, um, Stevenson was in it as well, which... Uh, yes, yes, he was. Yes. <laughs> Lieutenant uh, Henry Blake later uh, is on this Dirty Dancing television show. I'm sure he'd rather be remembered for MASH. Probably uh, so. Maybe it might have been part of his deal with CBS that he still had had some that he owed the <laughs> network. And then we'll stick him in this. Uh, And then, yeah, the sequel, uh, it's planned for 2025 because Hollywood is completely out of ideas. uh, So we're just going to rehash old IP. Uh, But Jennifer Grey is is attached to it to to reprise her role as baby, um, who would now be. Uh, grand, in her grandma sixties, yeah, yeah, probably with yeah, she would be one of the the guests at the resort. <laughs> uh, well, you um, know, you you haven't mentioned the Dirty Dancing Havana Nights. Oh, it, I forgot about that. There was a prequel, was there it, not? And it had Swayze in it, yeah. So, which is, I have never seen it, but now that I think about it, it, it makes my thesis about this being an allegory for the left uh, even better because it it's set during the Cuban Revolution. <laughs> Or a little before the so, you know there there have been two great American movies set uh, with that use the Cuban Revolution as as key plot points: uh, Dirty Dancing, Havana Nights, and The Godfather Two. So it's the <laughs> second it's the second best movie that's used the Cuban Revolution as a plot point. Uh, it's a distant second. I completely <laughs> forgot about that. Yeah, and I was I was reading about it. Of course, I, I remember when that came out, but I uh, I just forgot to include it in my notes. So thank you for bringing it up. So you have seen it? <gasps> no. <laughs> oh, okay. I, you, but you now, now I kind of more about it than I did. Well, I got a little. <laughs> I, well, I I needed to look it up because I didn't know if it came before or after. But it it does make sense because you. Uh, they, they, I guess the tie to the movie is that um, uh, Johnny is a dance instructor in Cuba and in Dirty Dancing, the one that we should all remember, he says he wants to do a Cuban thing at the for the final dance. And um, yep. Max's son says, how about the Pachanga? Uh, yeah. And what's hilarious about the Pachanga is Johnny treats it like it's old fashioned, but the Pachanga was a relatively new dance in 1963. Uh, it came out of Cuba in the late fifties. Uh, so what, what uh, he was suggesting was the same thing that Johnny was suggesting, but I, I guess cl- clearly is that uh, Johnny in, in Havana nights, this is where he learns all his, his Cuban dancing, I guess is the, the story. And what does he say in the next scene? He said he wouldn't know a good dance I, if it hit him in the pachanga. It hit him like in the pachanga. <laughs> yeah, he kind of overacts on that one a little bit. But uh. so after talking to you, I, I got to say, I now I need to watch it again. Unfortunately, my rental window has closed. I think so. I won't get to watch it again unless I go buy it out of the five dollar bin at Walmart on DVD, yeah, which I'm sure you can. <laughs> but if I, which I'm sure I can. I looked for it there yesterday. I did not catch on to any of the political <laughs> overtones until you mentioned it. So so I thank you. Thank you for introducing that backstory, because now it has a whole different meaning to me. Oh, it, yeah. You know, it was just a, a teenage love story about uh, possibly oh, some statutory oh, rape yeah, going on. Te- right? teen- teenage ish. One of them was a teenager. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and Jennifer Grey was actually 26 when the movie was filmed, which is crazy. Uh, playing 17. And Swayze was, I think, 34 playing, at the time. What? Probably 20, 28, 29, probably 30. Yeah, yeah somewhere like around there. But uh, I, I don't think I ever knew that Patrick Swayze was a classically trained dancer. Yeah, he was dancer. in the Joffrey Ballet. Yeah, he was like yeah. a like a real dancer. <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, and he, gosh, it's been almost what fifteen years or so since yeah, he passed since he away. It yeah. was, yeah, it was it was in the the late aughts there. Uh, I remember two thousand nine was when I heard about it. Yeah, so almost fifteen years. Well, Jr., thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you've definitely changed my mind about this movie. I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. It's not one that I was gonna 
probably uh, add to my, oh, I have to stop every time this is on TV list. But I did enjoy it. I'm glad I finally sat down to watch it. I'm glad to know now that it took place in the 60s because before this weekend, I had no idea. <laughs> and um, yeah, so so I would say I, I did enjoy it. And uh, it's one of those that uh, this was actually one of the ones when I put the list together, I was like, OK, this was near the top of the ones I wanted to watch. Um, of course, my wife made me watch Never Ending Story, which was probably at the bottom. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but not, I enjoyed that not one. one of my, not one of my favorites. Uh, <laughs> this is one of the ones that I wanted to watch. And I'm really glad I finally have watched it. Uh, and and now um, I'm more likely to to stick around if if uh, Audrey starts watching it. In the <laughs> <some point>. so. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you for joining me. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you. I loved it. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Video Oblivious. And stick around. Another new episode with a different movie is just a few days away. Thanks to my guests for being a part of the show. And if you'd like to be a part of the show, send me an email. ZBennett at gmail.com. That's Z-B-E-N-N-E-T-T at gmail.com. Maybe there's a movie you love that I've never seen. Send me an email. We'll connect and we might even talk about it here on the podcast. And don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, whatever your platform allows. Give us a good rating if you really enjoyed this podcast. And thanks again for listening to Video Oblivious. Video Oblivious.